Hi guys, welcome to today's MCQ discussion, MCQ discussion number 8. Before we start, some good news, we crossed a thousand subscribers yesterday. So thank you for all your support, all your likes, shares and subscribes and keep doing that and we'll keep covering topics. So question number 1, a 70 year old patient who is a known case of CKD was started on dialysis. After his first session of dialysis, he developed a sudden loss of consciousness and soon started having multiple seizures. CT brain was done and is shown in the image. What could be the probable cause? A. Anaphylaxis B. Aluminium toxicity C. Reverse urea effect and D. Hypotension So pause, think and then we'll discuss. So there's a lot to process here. Yeah, so firstly, we know it's a case of CKD. Secondly, most importantly, we know he's had his first session of dialysis ever and after that, soon after that, he lost his consciousness and started having seizures. And an imaging study was sent for and it revealed this. So, this is what, this is the question in a gist. Now look at the picture. This picture classically denotes or typically denotes a cerebral edema. You can see the brain looks swollen and you can't really make out the sulci, gyri or ventricles. So everything looks swollen. So this is very easy to make out. Very high yield and important image, but easy to make out. It is cerebral edema. Now, let's see, look at the options and see where all you can develop cerebral edema. And all those features, loss of consciousness and seizures are just because of the cerebral edema. So, we should look at the options and wonder where we can see cerebral edema. So, option A is anaphylaxis. We don't see cerebral edema in anaphylaxis. We know anaphylaxis presents as breathlessness, hypotension and all those things. So, it, it's not pro probably not anaphylaxis aluminium toxicity which is also a complication of dialysis but it usually presents with memory problems dementia those kind of features so again doesn't look like it reverse urea effect okay we don't know what that is and last one is hypotension again th this doesn't look like a simple hypotension case so Remember, dialysis is a very important topic for NEAT and in life in general and knowing the complications of dialysis is extremely important. So if you haven't studied them, you should study them in detail. I'll go through a few of the important complications because all of these options are complications. So yes, anaphylaxis is a complication. We know how anaphylaxis presents, so I won't delve into that. Option D, hypotension. Remember, the most common and most important complication of dialysis is hypotension. Twenty to 60% of dialysis episodes end up with hypotension. So remember, hypotension is the most common and most important complication of anaphylaxis, or, sorry, of dialysis. And you should know hypotension is a complication of this and this fact. So the third thing is aluminum toxicity. Yes, it is a complication and it usually presents with dementia, some CNS disturbances, sometimes even heartburn and all those features. Lastly, Reverse urea effect, we'll talk about that in detail. So the answer to this question is definitely C, reverse urea effect, because we ruled out the rest of the options. But we will discuss reverse urea effect in considerable detail. Other than this, it's also important to know a few more complications of dialysis. One of them is coagulopathy because of adding a lot of heparin to the dialysate fluid and the blood to prevent it from clotting in the system. So heparin can lead to coagulopathy. Second thing is hemolysis can happen again due to chemicals added in the dialysate fluid so these two also you can remember other than that muscle pain headache all those little obvious more obvious and less serious complications so coming to before we move into reverse urea effect let's look at the ct so this is how a cerebral edema looks and this is how the normal brain looks very easy to differentiate if you didn't differentiate during the question make sure you know the differences and learn how to differentiate because cerebral edema is high yield okay Lastly, the reverse urea effect. So what is this reverse urea effect? So this is an if effect or a condition that is usually seen during the first episode of dialysis. So whenever you hear someone enter, underwent his first episode of dialysis and the rest of the picture, you should always think of reverse urea effect. So what happens in reverse urea effect? So remember, in a case of CKD, the patient has a high level of urea in his body and his blood. So when this, this patient goes for dialysis, his blood is pretty rich in urea or the pre-dialysate blood or pre-dialysis blood has a 
large amount of urea and remember urea behaves like any other salt and maintains the osmolarity of the blood okay so the intravascular osmolarity is maintained by this urea now when there is dialysis for the first time there is rapid clearing of this urea in the blood so a lot of this urea is quickly cleared in very short span you clear a lot of urea and the blood becomes essentially urea free and then it's put back into the body so what happens now is the blood which initially had higher urea and therefore higher osmolarity is cleared of the urea and the osmolarity reduces so the blood which goes back into the body has a reduced osmolarity now this same blood flows through the tissues so remember the tissues still have a large amount of urea and therefore the tissues have a large osmolarity so what happens when because of this disequilibrium the fluids of the intravascular comp compartment or the fluids of the blood start moving to the tissue spaces or the interstitial spaces so look here we have this blood with lower osmolarity flowing like this and because the tissues still have a large amount of urea in them their osmolarity is higher and we know from physiology basics that fluids flow from a region of uh, of flow from a region of low concentration to high concentration so remember tissue has higher concentration of urea and therefore water or the fluid will move to the tissues to so that there's some kind of an equilibrium because right now the blood is hypotonic and the tissue is hypertonic so fluid moves from hypotonic to hypertonic and that's exactly what's happening here so the fluid starts moving out into the tissue and the fluid in the interstitial space increases which is nothing but edema so it, fluid in interstitial space increasing is called edema so here we start having tissue edema the same thing happens in the brain okay so when this happens in the brain parenchyma it leads to cerebral edema so that was reverse urea syndrome because it happens because of this disequilibrium of the urea in the tissue and in the blood because you're rapidly removing the urea in the blood but not removing the urea in the tissue and when you do this you have this disequilibrium which leads to the fluid moving out and edema all over so that is called reverse urea equilibrium or most the more common name is the dialysis disequilibrium syndrome okay so dialysis disequilibrium syndrome very important remember this name and it's a complication of especially the first time dialysis is done it's a complication and we discussed how it presents let's move to the second question for today decompression sickness is seen when an individual a rapidly moves from a region of high pressure to low pressure b rapidly moves from a region of low pressure to high pressure c gradually moves from a region of high pressure to low pressure or d gradually moves from a region of low pressure to high pressure so pause think and then we'll discuss so this topic is very important and from physiology this is one of the most asked topics in need and that's why the question has been included so decompression sickness it is also called diverse disease it's also called dysbarism it's also called Kaysen's disease it's also called the bends so these are the other common names sometimes also called barotrauma so these are the other common names essentially the same thing decompression sickness so where do you see it so if you remember well you know that gradually moving from low pressure to high pressure or high pressure to low pressure doesn't really make any difference to the body. So the real doubt is between A and B that is rapidly moves between these pressure systems. So remember when you compress something you are taking it from a state of low pressure to a state of high pressure. Okay, And when you decompress something you are taking it from a state of high pressure to a state of low pressure. So similarly you can always remember decompression sickness happens when there is decompression which means the person is rapidly moving from a high pressure to a low pressure so the answer is a decompression sickness is seen when an individual moves from a region of high pressure to a region of low pressure rapidly okay usually it is an ascent so a rapid ascent causes decompression sickness i'll tell you why where all is it seen first divers most common second in pilots that go in unpressurized aircrafts and third very rarely sometimes can also be seen in mountaineers now let's take divers because they are the classical example so divers are coming 
and it's seen when they ascend so they are coming from a region of high pressure that is under the ocean or under the sea back to the land that's when you see it when they come from under the ocean back to the land that's when you see this disease so therefore they are coming from a region of high pressure to low pressure quickly and that's how you see it similarly pilots are going from the land to the sky and remember the higher the altitude the lesser the pressure so pilots are moving from a high pressure land to a low pressure sky and that's why they see it so it is a rapid movement from high pressure to low pressure that causes decompression sickness very important concept that's why i'm stressing on it you should know this and not make a mistake one more thing is i told you it's also called the bends and why is it called the bends because this syndrome or this sickness presents usually with a lot of muscle pain and people start bending and twisting and there's a characteristic motion that they have and that's why this disease is also called the bends now let's look at why this happens rather the pathophysiology of this disease so we have here we have a diver he's inhaled some air and he's going under water so he's moving from a region of low pressure to high pressure doesn't really affect his body that motion or that shift doesn't really affect him now he's under water and he's in a region of high pressure here is when the disease process begins so remember when pressure is higher the solubility of gases is more so the higher the pressure the more the solubility of gases so all the air in this individual's lung this diver's lung especially the nitrogen in this diver's lung becomes more soluble and all this especially the nitrogen molecules become more soluble and become uh, part of the blood you know they get dissolved into the blood and they start flowing in the body so now if this individual rapidly ascends so he comes up quickly all this nitrogen is still in his body or in his circulation and when he comes up back to the low pressure the solubility of nitrogen reduces and this nitrogen starts forming bubbles in his blood so as soon as he comes up if he comes up so quickly the nitrogen is still in circulation and it starts forming air bubbles all over the body and depending on where the air bubbles form the symptoms are seen so a rapid ascent because rapid ascent means rapidly you're moving from high pressure to low pressure and when you go to low pressure nitrogen becomes insoluble again or insoluble and then it forms bubbles again so it becomes gas again within your blood stream so you'll have air bubbles all over the place how can this be prevented very easy a slow ascent with the diver breathing so remember it's not just enough that he ascends slowly but he should not hold his breath while ascending because the excess air especially the nitrogen molecules are cleared out by breathing so as you keep coming up slowly the nitrogen becomes less soluble and then the lungs clear it out so you need to come or ascend gradually to allow the lungs to clear out the excess nitrogen that is collected so remember again it's always seen in rapid ascent okay so high pressure to low pressure and it's cleared out or it can be avoided by going slowly and giving the lungs enough time to clear out the nitrogen that is dissolved in the blood so that was about disparism few points the treatment remember if the as soon as the patient comes out now or the diver whoever if the disease has already occurred i told you prevention is this if he's already come out too fast there's really nothing you can do only supportive care and that is firstly put the patient in supine position because if he's erect the air bubbles have a tendency to go to the brain and we don't want that to happen so first put the patient in supine position administer oxygen correct his temperature if because he is underwater changes clothes it will be wet so we don't want hypothermia to set in so correct and correct any fluid electrolyte disturb disturbance basically the abc is what we want to do but remember supine position is very important because we don't want the air air bubbles to go to the cerebral circulation lastly the definitive treatment is something called recompression therapy in which you put the patient and gradually put the patient in a something called a recompression chamber and gradually uh, control the pressures so that was briefly about the management next two questions are very easy the resection of which intestinal segment causes vitamin b12 deficiency a duodenum b jejunum c ileum and d sigmoid so very easy okay so the answer here is ileum this question is basically a fancy way of asking where is vitamin b12 absorbed so remember vitamin b12 is absorbed in the ileum and therefore the answer is ileum i include this question to bring in this very nice mnemonic that helps me remember where what is absorbed so three things you have to remember where it's absorbed 
first thing you have to remember is where is iron absorbed second thing where is folic acid absorbed and where is b12 absorbed all these three are frequently asked so you should know where iron is absorbed where folic acid is absorbed and where b12 is absorbed and that's when this mnemonic comes to play so remember this mnemonic dude is just feeling ill bro okay dude is just feeling ill bro so what does that mean so d i duodenum iron j f jejunum folic acid i l b helium b12 so the answer here was helium b12 so very nice mnemonic dude is just feeling ill bro which which is duodenum iron is absorbed in the duodenum folic acid is absorbed in the jejunum and b12 is absorbed in the helium so nice mnemonic fun mnemonic and i think we are running out of time for today so three questions only we discussed but three good questions three nice concepts frequently asked concepts so thank you see you in tomorrow's discussion